By the way, we are celebrating 60 years of Daredevil. If you case you haven't been able to tell all weekend long at Terrificon, he was in the feature film. Let's give a huge Terrificon welcome to Joe Pantoliano. Joey Pants is here. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, can you, all, can you all hear me or do I need to move this closer? Thank you. Who's your buddy? Oh, this is Delilah. Uh, Delilah is a rescue. She was a puppy mill mom. She had two litters and that two they were going to destroy her. And my, my daughter works for a rescue in New Jersey and we uh, were going to uh, foster parent her. But then I, I fell in love with her. And she's, uh, she's a good puppy. She, she, she's not used to being around a lot of people. You know, because she lived in a cage uh, for a couple of years and then so when we got her, she didn't even know what stairs were. It was, it was brutal. I saw she was a little hesitant on these ones here, yeah. so that sticks with them. Yeah, just, they... just you know, un unfamiliar um, territory um, freaks her out. Yeah, she gets. But I'm 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 glad that I was able to take have, her. Have you fostered dogs before? Uh, Is this a first? My daughter has, and uh, we, you know, never from, never from a, a, um, a, um, a rescue. Okay. You know, so she's, she's our first rescue. Uh, and we have two other dogs that are Shih Tzu Laps. They're, they were my wife's colleague. Her dogs had puppies, and so we took three from the litter. Uh, my daughter has one of them. And the other two, so the three of them, uh, uh, live with us. But when we travel, we can't take them with. And I was just in LA for, for uh, just over two weeks. And, okay. And I only got back on Monday. I'm just curious because we uh, we got a rescue dog as well too. But I know a lot of people that do like shelter, so they'll take them in, they'll take them in temporarily, and then they'll find them again. How tough is that, though? Do you become attached to the to the little doggies? Do you, I mean, how tough is that to give them back? Well, you on know, the back? I, I guess it's <laughs> awfully tough because I've never given one back. Yeah, you know, it's like you I just wind keep up them in. Them. Yeah, I think that would be the toughest thing for me. It'd be like, oh, I'll give it a good home. All right, this is the good home. You're already used to it. You know where the steps are. So you go on like that. Yeah. Um, when you were here in 2022, uh, so welcome back. Thanks. Welcome back to Terrificon. It's great to have you back here again. We talked about, uh, well, obviously we talked a lot about Goonies. Um, are you okay if we talk more about Goonies today? We just love talking about Goonies. Sure. I, you know, whatever you guys want to talk about. Yeah. And we do have a microphone over here, so if you've got questions, please feel free to jump on the mic. Um, again, I've done this. I can nerd out all day long. But I did ask you at the time about Goonies 2. So okay. I'm sure you've heard about Goonies 2, there's an interest in it. There's maybe people that like would like to see a Goonies 2 or what that would be. Um, I think at the time you said there's certainly an interest a couple years ago, but it just like well, you wasn't solidifying. I don't know. Can, is there anything? Can you give us any hope? Is there anything? No, I, I, <laughs> you know, I, I, had a, I had dinner with Jeff Cohen, who played Chunk, and, uh, and Jeff is now an industry uh, attorney. In fact, yeah. he now represents Key Kwan, yes. uh, yeah, right. among others. He's, he's very successful uh, showbiz uh, attorney. And uh, we were talking about Warner Brothers. I mean, all of the studios are in so much trouble. Uh, financial, you know, Paramount just got bought out. They shut down their TV division. Um, um, there's major layoffs. I just was working in Los Angeles and talking to the crew. Um, you know, 50% of the people are out of work. Uh, just to live in the Los Angeles area is incredibly expensive. And, uh, you know, it's like starting over. They say, okay, well, you, you're a production designer or you're a set dresser. You can work ev everywhere. Well, the industry has grown even from when I started. You know, when I started in the, in the early 70s, the idea of being in the entertainment world was elusive, unattainable. Well, you know, my, my parents were like, what are you, crazy? 
who do you think you are? You can't be an actor. Um, and then with, with shows, with the success of um, bringing um, like Rona Barrett, the celebrity talk shows uh, on TV where they're t interviewing celebrities, uh, and then HBO with Entourage and people are watching that show and, and thinking, hey, that would be fun to be a celebrity's assistant. So the industry grew. Um, agencies are, are falling apart. You know, when I went to Hollywood, there were like four or five agencies, big agencies, mm -hmm. William Morris, the, the unattainable agencies, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of just making a living, uh, trying to make a living. And in Hollywood, you can't make a living it's not good enough. You got to make a killing, um, and uh, and you're competing with other countries because they create these tax incentives. I just worked on a show in Vancouver, um, so in order to do a Goonies, and they you know they've spent millions developing the Goonies right. sequel uh, 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 over the last 35 years. Um, written scripts. You've uh, seen them? You've seen the scripts? No, I, I, okay. I, 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 a couple of years ago, somebody, somebody, uh, a very successful showrunner writer had pitched Dick Donner before he passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and Dick and Steven Spielberg gave him permission to reach out to some of the actors, I guess. He reached out to Robert Dobby and I and, and explained the opening oh, okay. of how the opening of the sequel would, would work. But, you know, they don't make, they don't make movies like that anymore. It right. was all practical, it yeah. was all real, it was done on film. Um, the ship know, was real, they built a ship. They, you guys yeah, crawled all over that thing. Yeah, they, uh, it was from the blueprint of Captain Blood with Errol <laughs> Flynn. It was on the same soundstage. Wow. Uh, and uh, so, you know, they're, you know, Josh Brolin. How do you get Josh Brolin to come back? You, you know, you got to pay him a fortune. Well, but he's, I think he's gone on talk shows and he loves the Goonie. Like, you, you think, like, maybe he wouldn't, but, like, he goes and he just talks about it with such joy and it just seems like everybody wants to do it. and i think we had heard like maybe it's the kids of the goonies maybe like they could and then the the goonie parents have to come in or something like how how would the they work? come up with all they, they, you've heard a bunch every, of different every every one of those scenarios yeah every which do, do you prefer like did any of them make you go oh that that would be really fun to do you know and these are fanboy questions. I'm sorry. No, they are. They're definitely I, I, fanboys. Uh, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't have a dog in the race. I mean, if, yeah. if they were able to come up with an idea and they could get everybody to come back. That's it. That would be like, uh, you know, like winning the lottery. Yeah. You know, to be able to. You know, I mean, I've, I've been a part of some very successful franchises, right? Bad Boys, I just did. Bad Boys 4, um, you know, I did two uh, Marshall movies with Tommy Lee Jones, mm -hmm. uh, you know, The Fugitive, and, uh, and, and when those movies were being made, I think Indiana Jones is the first serialized version, right? But before that, you made a movie and that was it, I think. Mm -hmm. I don't recall. A little Star Wars probably sneaked in, probably Star Wars yeah, and Indiana Jones, Wars, and that was it, yeah. Well, Star Wars was probably the first then. Yeah. I mean, it was serialized, uh, in the in the movies, they've always done serialization. Flash yeah. Gordon mm -hmm. in the '30s, um, you know, Saturday matinees. Yeah. But um, but now it's uh, you know it it it's so hard to make a good movie, uh, and you know to make a, um, a a a movie of of merit. And it seems to me that all, a lot of these studio movies, they all look the same. Yeah. I can't, I can't even tell the difference. Um, you know, the, the formula is all the same. The CGI, uh, the special, yeah, it looks like a video and, game a lot uh, of times. You know, I, I, now they're, they're doing things like, after the strike, when I went back to work, you know, there was the, um, the writer's strike and then the actor's strike. 
And, uh, and as soon as I went back, I was working on a Marvel show. And they said, what we're doing, the, we have to do the plates. And I was like, what's a plate? And uh, they use these silver balls and they, and they film like, like the big wide shot if they wanted to do this. They put the camera here and they would just pan. Um, and eventually, they, they'll be able to use those as sets. Uh, so in the very near future, I'm going to be working on a green, a green screen stage. Uh, this will all be green or blue. Um, usually it's the color of that, that lad in the back, that lime green yep. shirt. Y you. That's, <laughs> like I, just, I just did something uh, where there was it, it, the flats. We, we shot it outside. The backdrop was you know, um, California redwoods. And, and the, the green screen was one and a half times the height of this. And probably twice the size of this, all the wow. way around. And, Massive. Uh, and, they'll, and they'll CGI a background and a river and a lake. So they, you know, the, and all of the new sound stages that they're building in, in New Jersey, um, in, in Queens, all of the states that have these tax credit incentives, uh, where you'll have that. And it's like when you go to New York City and you see those big, big advertising billboards mm -hmm. that can change, you know, or, or baseball games. They'll, you'll, you'll press that, and, and this will all immediately become whatever you want. You could be on the top of Mount Everest, yeah. and then this can be a desk. You know, they could turn this into the Oval Office. Well, I've heard they, actors talk about doing that because it's – Prior to this, it would be acting against the tennis ball, acting, here's a big giant monster coming in, and you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. But now they can re recreate these environments. They're virtual, it's, it's but at more, least it gives you a point of reference depth. But you're, 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 back to, you're back to my theater training, where you're using your imagination. Mm -hmm. You know, in the theater, when I was training, if, if I was doing um, a play where it was the dead of winter. Um, and so my entrance is, I'm shaking the snow off and I'm talking about how cold it is. You've got to recreate that, you know, sensorily. Um, throughout my career in the movies, if it was cold out, you shot, it was cold out. You know, you didn't <laughs> shot have to. Shot in Chicago. You know, that was one <laughs> thing Jones. less you had to act about. You know, there was no acting required. Yeah. It really is cold. Yeah. You I mean, wouldn't have to do that on this platform, by the way, because it is freezing up here right yeah, now. Yeah, I, I was watching uh, I was watching on Turner the other day. They were uh, showing Agnes of God with Anne Bancroft, Meg Tilly, and Jane Fonda. And there's a scene with Jane Fonda and uh, Anne Bancroft uh, outside, and you can see the steam coming out. Mm. And, and you can sense... You know, uh, both of them were freezing their <laughs> ass off. Shake. I mean, you could actually see Anne Bancroft's teeth rattling. Yeah. Well, you know, to be able to create that, you're going to have to do it, you know, you're going to have to act it. It's yeah. going to be sens sensorily. Um, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating time, but it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs. A lot of people are going to be out of work. And if that's happening in show business, that's going to happen across the board everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see where AI takes everything, and you go from. Did I hear you say it was Marvel? Did I hear you say Marvel? Mm -hmm. Okay, is that something now you're doing? That's all you're going to hear. They have so to, that's the other thing they have is what they call NDAs. Yeah. Okay. You can't say anything. Yeah. You know, I my age, I had to say. Because you know, it's my job to, to continue to do this. Yeah, and I, I, and I appreciate that. You keep going. I enjoy telling you to go. For uh, you and most people that I know, that yeah. is, that is, you would not be the I, first and you definitely won't be the last. I read a script, I, you know, I had to read something and the agent, you know, and, and also that's the other thing, they don't talk to you anymore, you know, my, used to be on the phone, they call you up and say, listen, you got the job and uh, now it's all, it's all done in emails. And so he said, well, what, you know, what, what'd you think of the script? And I said, I can't tell you what I thought of the script, I signed an NDA. Even to, oh, 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 okay. You yeah. know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very so, interesting. So, TV feature? Can, or, are you allowed to say if it's television or feature? You can't say that. That would get you in trouble. 
because they do both now. There's Marvel stuff everywhere. Um, yeah. New character, established comic book character. Well, you're not going to get it's me It's new anything. to me. Yeah, all right. But we, I, listen, I'm just the back of my hair standing on the back of my neck here is just knowing you're in a Marvel project because that, another Marvel project. We're going to talk about the other one in a little bit. But just that you're in there. Are you having fun doing it? Are you enjoying it? Uh, you, I, that's not in the NDA. Are you enjoying it? You know, I'm still enjoying it, but I just did something that wasn't um, the uh, thing you mentioned. Uh, I was working on something else I can't talk about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Those are the ones yeah, we love. It was a, there, there was an announcement. I, I, I did the, uh, I just worked on an episode of Dexter, the prequel. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and I had... You know, I had um, I had a sequence, you know, like a roughhouse sequence, you know, stunts involved, mm -hmm. bouncing into furniture, that kind of thing, and you know, stunt double and a stunt stunt double rehearsal. I'm going to be 73 <laughs> next month, um, so I'm feeling it. You know, I yeah, I. I, I, I'm excited. You know, I, I enjoy going to work. I enjoy the fact that I'm still able to work. Um, and, uh, and I get a kick out of it. But, you know, when, when you've been lucky enough to work as much as I have, you, you, you see, you, you can spot experience immediately. And you can spot inexperience just as quickly, um, and I and I actually I wrote a, uh, a, a note to my director yesterday because I thought it was night shooting, you know, in Pasadena. It was you know day, two days before the earthquake, but it was like five o'clock in the morning, and I was you know running down the street in my underwear, um, and uh, and I was grumpy, you know, it was like. <laughs> And some of the stuff that, you know, I had to, you know, trip and roll and, you know, so they used my stunt guy for that. But then on the tighter versions, they need, they need you to do it. And I did it a couple of times and I didn't want to do it again. You know, I was like, <laughs> let him do it. Um, yeah. But, you know, I felt like it's my job to do it. Yeah. You know, that's, that's. That's what they, they pay me to show up. You know, they, they need me in a piece of it. Right. And they need to do it, you know, four, five, or six times. Then I, it's my responsibility to give them that. Well, this is maybe where you get AI to work for you because you let the other guy do it, and then they just AI your face over it. That's what they're going to do. That's what they're going to have to do. Yeah, let them let them do the work. But there's a, it's a fine line because on on uh, another couple of shows I, I shot, they wanted to. Uh, what do they call it? Digitize me? Mm -hmm. Is that what they call it? Like de-age or? They wanted but, to. They wanted to like scan me. Oh, okay. So like they oh, wanted, so like you're making an action figure of somebody. They'll scan everything. They wanted to scan. And then they can do whatever they want. With and it. I and I would you know I I said no. Yeah. Because they they can then warehouse that. Right. Like like the set. Yep. Yeah, you could yeah. be making movies for the next two hundred years. You and, know, I, uh, I, I, <laughs> I I I I have no. I have no grievance um, of them using, you know, using my likeness as long as they pay me for it, and yes. as long as I own it. Yes. You know, I don't. I don't want to give it away to some studio. Well, that was the sticking point in the strike last year, and so I think hopefully they've got all that worked out. And I think I heard you just say that you have a Marvel action figure coming out. I don't. I don't know if that, if I read that completely I wrong. I said that. Yeah, I think that's what I heard. Um, we've got an uh, audience question here. Can you tell us uh, your name and where you're from. Um, my name is Scott. I'm from New Hampshire. Hey, Scott. Hi, Scott. Um, I actually have three questions, if I may. Sure. Um, we got time. All right. Um, Bad Boys. Obviously, the first two were only eight years apart, and the last two were four years apart. But between that, 17 years. What What was it like going back to that after 17 years? It was It was wild. It was It was great. I mean, the the, the third one was um, without Michael Bay. You know, um, uh, uh, Dylan Bilal, the, the new directors, but like Jerry Bruckheimer, and. Uh, 
and you know, and Will's production company. So on the third one, I was uh, you know working for Will and Jerry, um, and it was it was great fun, um, and and everybody you know has grandkids and and kids, and uh, you know Will's got his family and and and, and all of his friends, uh, and he's. In, Incredibly loyal. The makeup and hair team has been him since since Fresh Prince. Oh wow! Uh, and uh, and you know Martin's sister. I got to know you know I've, of course I know Martin, but I got to know his sister who you know visiting over the years. I, I met her on the first one. I met her on the second one. You know and and and, and that's a real luxury. Uh, that's a, a real gift when when you're lucky enough to be a part of that uh, and, and working with, with people um, that we were all starting out together. I, um, my second question is, is, I'm a huge fan of Broken Lizard, Kevin Heffernan, Steve Lemmy, been watching Tacoma FD. Um, is working on that or was working on that as fun as it seemed like it would be? I had a good time, yeah. Uh, I, I really, I really like working with with that with those those guys. I like that kind of silly humor. It, you know, it's the closest thing I'll ever get to, um, like working with the Three Stooges or you know, <laughs> Abbott and Costello. It's that kind of that kind of crazy humor and 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 uh, and and Lemmy and, and and Kevin. You know, Kevin's from West. West Haven, uh, you know, so they're just regular, regular folks that work hard and have wild imaginations. And the last question, this will be a quick one, on uh, U.S. Marshals, did they let you keep the purple tracksuit? Did somebody else, somebody else just asked me that. I just, I just, uh, I'm downsizing, so I got rid of a lot of, a lot of memorabilia I've, I've collected over the years, but I didn't. That's, that's one thing I didn't collect. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. I don't even remember the purple tracks. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me, I, I find you a very funny actor, but you scared the crap out of me as the villain in The Matrix. What was your head say? You are like the scariest villain. I mean, my, my, how, what were you thinking of? Oh, God. You know, it's so hard to answer these things that happened 30 years ago. Um, I'm just happy that, that, that he made you uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, you know, the, 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 when I looked at that character in the scope of things, it's so funny, I saw Keanu earlier today. I haven't seen him in 15 years. Um, and it was so nice to see him. Um, but but when I was working on that and working with Wachowskis, I, I you know and the, I don't know if it's clear when you see that movie, but but Cipher also had a choice. You know he he was also taken from the Matrix and given a choice to see the real world or not, and and and, and made a choice. Uh, you know and I had come to the conclusion that I was going to play him as the most human person. You know, if you look at the Matrix and, the, and all of those characters that are following Morpheus, it's a cult. It's a cult of personality because they are following um, someone based on a mythology. So that's something you can taste or you can see, right? He's saying to you that this is not real. This is fake, but you're, gonna, you're not going to know unless you make a choice and take the pill. And so based on the, on the behavior of, of those characters, Trinity and, and Mouse, and the way that they followed him, I chose that Cypher had doubt. Um, and, and I don't know if it's clear when you see the movie, but there were like, there have been four or five ones, right, that were killed by the agents. So. Cypher has decided that he's not going to believe uh, Morpheus. He's angry at Morpheus. He believes 
that he sold him a bill of goods. He's also in love with Trinity, and that's never going to happen because he can see that she loves Neo. Uh, and he feels like he's made a terrible mistake. And then he's given an opportunity to correct that mistake by betraying the people he loves, but given an option that in that betrayal, he'll have no memory of ever doing anything wrong. He'll be reinstated into the matrix as someone who is important and wealthy and famous, right? Uh, and never knowing that it's fake, that it's not real, right? And, uh, and I always thought the reason why people, that, that fans of the matrix, um, v villainized Cypher, the traitor, you're the traitor, you know, he's Judas. Um, so he sold him for a bag of gold, but Judas, had he not committed suicide, would have, would have had to live with that for the rest. And without a Judas, you don't have a Jesus Christ. Um, so the whole, the whole idea of mythology and, uh, and Cypher, I mean, what would you have done? I think it was brilliant because why it was so chilling is you made us see him as a real person like us <laughs> with yeah. an evil side and a good side. <laughs> yeah, because we all, have, we all have that, right? Under, under certain, uh, you know, under the right circumstances, we can become any of those things in life based yeah. on opportunity and situations. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we talked about that in, a, you know, one of the earlier panels, too, is uh, with C. Thomas Howell, is how you can't, and he said he basically got this direction from Rutger Hauer, who was talking, was he can't, he doesn't play bad guys. You can't, you can't play the bad guy. Because the bad, he doesn't know it's a bad guy. He doesn't, he's thinking he's doing whatever it is he has to do. Um, and then you become that sort of mustache twirling, <laughs> you know, that you go, you sort of lean too much into the other way, so yeah, you have to play it's, him it's, as it's, it's more sympathetic. Gray, it's more gray area. You know, it's not, you know, there are some people that are diabolical, you know, uh, but, but some, sometimes, it's about power and control. Mm -hmm. You want to control the situation. Yeah. And, and who is expendable, and who, and everybody's expendable, um, sadly. You mentioned Bad Boys. Um, I want to ask you about another buddy cop movie that I, we didn't get to talk about the last time you were here. Uh, I want to jump, if you don't mind, I want to jump back all the way back to 1986 uh, with Running Scared. Uh, I was happen to just, uh, yeah, it's a fantastic movie. Um, I heard uh, Sweet Freedom, Michael McDonald came on there, and I was like, you know what? I haven't seen this movie in such a long time. I want to pop it in and see if it holds up. My goodness, does that thing hold up. Can you give us any memories of... of oh, yeah. Because it's like the two, the two guys you never made cops, Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines. It's like you get the dancing guy, you get the funny guy from the sitcom. You would never think they would be these like hard-boiled cops, and it's just, and then you come in in the middle of this as this sort of crazy comic relief thing. I, I don't even know. It's just it holds up. It, it, it's uh, I had so much fun on that, and we shot a lot of the interiors at MGM when it was still MGM. Now it's Sony. All of these studios are now owned by electronics companies. Isn't that weird? <laughs> uh, it's like Citizen Kane all over again. It's like you know you have your hand in everything. But anyway, so we were, on, we were at MGM and we shot a lot of the interiors. And then we did the exteriors in Chicago, uh, about five weeks uh, of exteriors. And, uh, and I used to run on the, rib, on, the, on the lake. And they had these, in all the hotels, these glass revolving doors because when it gets cold and windy in Chicago, if you use a regular double door, it gets blown off the hinges. They, they, they nail those down when the winter comes. And I remember when, toward the end of October, I, I was going out for my run, and I, I went through the glass door, and that wind, cold wind hit me in the face, and I never even stopped. I just kept going back into the hotel. Because <laughs> you guys were shooting in the winter. To your earlier yeah, point, yeah, it was like, if you're going to shoot in the winter, shoot in the winter. Yeah, it was very, it was extremely cold. And we had, yeah. 
all of the stuff in the in the cop car, mm -hmm. you know, where my character was sitting in the back <laughs> seat between scene. the two of them, and uh, and it was so cold. It was like twenty to be below, and it was really windy. And so when they were changing lenses and the, on the camera, um, we all decided to just stay in the car because they had the heater in the mm -hmm. car. And uh, and I was just you know listening to Billy Crystal tell stories of how he met Mickey Mantle, and Gregory wow. was telling stories when you know he was with Heinz Heinz and Dad, and he and then and then his dad retired, and then he and his brother Maurice were you know just hoofers and he told a great story where he get they got a call that the, there was an injury the two dancers on a tour with Judy Garland and they had to go upstate New York to Albany for one night and they took the train up there and uh, and they got to the theater and they were supposed to have like a 15 minute rehearsal with Judy Garland but she never showed up and they and they were like insulted and so they planned to screw her up you know, the choreographer gave them the moves, but they, de they decided they, they were going to teach her a lesson. <laughs> and, uh, and, it was, and the song was Me and My Shadow. And she's singing the song. She goes stage left uh, and comes out with one of the dancers, stage right, and comes out with the other. And they do the routine, and then the same thing goes back, stage left, and disappears stage right. And, they, uh, and Greg said that they tried everything to screw her up, but every move that they made, she just naturally went with it. Wow. She improvised with them. Wow. And she, you know, and, if, and I don't even know, he doesn't even know if, if she ever even thought it was intentional because they never met her. They, you know, so it was like she didn't right. show up for rehearsal and then the show was over and, and, and the, they, they danced with her, but they never met her after the show. Wow. That's fantastic. That, that, and by the way, in the car is my favorite scene because you're like, they're, they're off doing something, arresting somebody, and you're in the car grabbing the police radio on it, and you're like, calling all cars, call it. Like, and Crystal comes in and just levels you through the window. It's a fantastic movie. I mean, you, had, you guys had to have a blast. Even though it was the dead of winter in Chicago, I mean, I guess you guys had a blast doing that. Yeah, everybody did. Yeah, that's a fun, that's a fun film to watch. It's the 60th anniversary of Daredevil. The last time you were here, I didn't get a chance to ask you much about it. There, so Can, the comic book Daredevil has been around for 60 years? Yep. Yep. I can't and you're part of the history. I'm older than the comic book. <laughs> <laughs> you're part of the history. Can you tell us a little bit about your experiences? How did you get involved with the Daredevil movie? Um, and by the way, when you watch the director's cut, you're in so much more of it. Like, I... I know there was a lot of Ben's backstory or Ben's story that goes on that sort of got jettisoned. What, what are your memories of, of filming that? Because at least we have them all now on the director's cut. I, I, I don't, you know. I know we're going back a little bit, but. Well, I, I remember, I vaguely remember I was working on The Sopranos and they had, I had to, I remember the sequence. If you're, if you've seen The Sopranos, there's a scene where my my character's son uh, gets an arrow in his chest because he's catching arrows, and and Ralph is running. I, I, he was in the tub. He was about to take a shower, so he's he's running through the field, and he runs down to his boy, uh, and he cradles him, and. And I had to catch a, a, a plane because I had to shoot the next morning on Daredevil. And so we did that, and I, I changed in the car. I gave him the Ralphie wig. Um, and I got in the car, and I put, the, you know, I put my clothes on and I left the Ralphie clothes in the car. Uh, they dropped me off at the airport. Uh, I, I took the you know, red eye. I, I went. I reported to work the following morning. I worked with Ben and Kevin Smith mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, that day, and then I got on a plane and I flew back to to New York, where I had to work again on on the Sopranos, um, and then I then I went back. Uh, so I just remember everybody being. 
and, you know, nice and, and enjoying the experience. And um, uh, Kevin Feig was, uh, was an assistant to Avi Anard, um, and my friend Gary Foster, who, whose father, David, had produced Running Scared. Uh, Gary was producing this. I, you know, I knew Gary when he was a PA on The Mean Season, which was also a David Foster production. Uh, you know, so it's like, it's like a village. You know, it's, it's the people you meet yeah. on the way up yeah. uh, that are growing and eventually going to be colleagues or people you work for. Um, and, uh, oh, and also, um, Colin, um, Colin Farrell. Yeah. What was that char his character? Bullseye. Bullseye. Yeah. He was great. He was, he was, he was, I, I got to know him probably better. Uh, and I and I had a lot of laughs with him. As I said, it's weird because you don't have many scenes. But I don't even know if you have any scenes with him. I'm trying to remember throughout yeah. the film, but it's like so you didn't have much time to prep for this. Then, if you were bouncing back and forth between the Sopranos, did you, were you familiar with the character of Daredevil from the comics? Had you read him growing up at all? You're you're playing a journalist. Did they did you get a chance to even prep as as a journalist? I know sometimes actors will you know follow a, a reporters around or something like I've, that or did I've you done, just kind of i you know i was a photojournalist on, on a movie uh called the mean season mm -hmm. you know and i i i really didn't have much time to prep and uh you know it, it, it he he was more of an expositional you know character he, he i think he narr originally he was supposed to narrate it like in, in an earlier version of the film i think your your voice was supposed to come in and narrate it I, I just don't remember. <laughs> no, that's fair. I listen. I go I back to the Mrs. Maybe time. that's why I'm not in the series. Well, I just don't remember. No, it's it's so interesting because it's like a lot of that stuff. Like Coolio was in it, and there's like a lot of courtroom stuff. Like you're in the court. Like you're following Ben Ben Affleck's. And does it, that, it, am I wrong that my character, my character knows is the one that knows that he's the. He he figures it out. I mean, basically, when you watch the director's cut, you're following him like sort of the whole way around. You know. Matt Murdock is involved in this somehow. And then by the time you get to the end, you're like, there's my Pulitzer. And then you just like hit delete on the whole story. And you're just like on his side uh, through the whole thing. But it's just curious because there's so much with Coolio. There's a backstory. It's, I got to say. There's a yeah. murder in a subway. And you're the one that flicks the, the, and the, the, the DD catch, the double D catches fire. And there's all that going on. Have you, have you seen the Did you get a chance to see the movie when it came out? I don't think I did. Okay, because you probably would have been like, where's all my scenes? Because <laughs> it, it was, they do try to get to the action pretty quick with Electra, with Jennifer Garner. And... I, uh, I knew Jennifer Garner was in it. Okay, yeah, was but you remember cool. filming with Kevin Smith, though, because there's a really cool scene I where... I remember seeing, it was like... A, if anything cool happened, if you find anything cool... What do you call, what do you call it? Uh, the the corn is The morgue, right? you're in the morgue, yes. If you find anything cool, give me a call, and he's like, I found this, and you're like, and it turns out it's... It's Matt Murdock's cane, and it's Daredevil's weapon. Oh. Uh, OK, no worries. I just, listen, <laughs> these are all fanboy questions. So I just was curious you know, if you had any favorite uh, memories about filming that. So um, but now you can go back and watch the director's cut and watch all of your scenes take yeah, place. Uh, it's a much better version of it. Um, and you've apparently re-entered the Marvel Universe for us. So, Maybe it has something to do with Daredevil. Who knows? Um, I can I can say I can tell you that it has nothing to do with it. With Daredevil, okay, that's fair. He's, there's a whole other Daredevil, and he'll be here on Sunday, and so you can get to meet. You can meet the new Daredevil. You can make new memories with Daredevil with Charlie Cox. That'll be cool. I'm sure he'll be right next day. <laughs> um, I do want to ask you. Um, you did found a nonprofit organization. No kidding, me too. Correct. Can you talk a little bit about that and the importance of that and how we can know more about that? Well, we start. You know, I I start. I was diagnosed with clinical depression. I was really in bad shape uh, in 2012, around there. No, it was no. It was after 9/11. Something happened, and uh, it just my the whole world it kicked up all this emotional dust from past trauma that I didn't know I had, and it just 
it was a rough four, five or six years. And, uh, and so when I finally got the help that I needed and I was, I was working through all of that, um, uh, at some point, I, I, I couldn't work. And I had, a, I had a Wheaton Terrier bogey who was like, this is before they had service dogs, or they called him that. But he, he was my service dog uh, unofficially. And, and uh, if I had meetings, I would take him to New York. I couldn't get in the car unless I had him in the car with me. And, uh, and when I was able to get back to work, when, when you work on a, on a job, they take an insurance policy out. They want to make sure you're healthy. So if you got sick, they, they can, you know, the insurance company's betting that you're not going to get sick or die. Uh, and so when I, and it's just a generic, they take your blood pressure. It's, it's, uh, it's more questions like, do you smoke, do you drink? Um, uh, and, uh, and they asked if I was on any prescription medication. And I said, yeah, well, I, I take Lipitor because I have a history of heart disease. And I'm, I, I'm taking the same dosage of, uh, of an antidepressant because I have a history of, of, of depression in, my, in my, my family, in my life. Uh, so a couple of days later, my lawyer calls and he says, we got a problem with, with this. Uh, it, the insurance company is not going to insure you because you're taking an antidepressant. So you've got to sign a waiver if you have a breakdown and you cause a slow down or stoppage to the work, it's gonna be on you. And I said, well, that, that's like, you know, a day's work would render me bankrupt if I missed a day. I said, what about my heart? He says, what? I said, well, you know, I take medicine because I have a history of heart disease. What if I have a heart attack? He said, ah, heart attack, they'll cover that. I said, well, why would they cover that and not my brain? I, I, I don't understand why they're discriminating against one of my, Unreal. my vital organs. So that pissed me off. I signed the paper because I needed to work. And, uh, you know, I started talking about it. It was just kind of rolling around there. And, uh, and I talked to a lot of my friends that are high-profile movie stars, and they would say, oh, I just don't tell them. You know, because a lot of people were on that. And it wasn't cool. In those days, it, you know, people didn't talk about that. If you... If you had a bipolar disorder and uh, you know, you're addicted to cocaine, uh, you know, a, a substance, they would, and you had to go to rehab, they would call it, they would call it um, alcohol, because alcohol was more, being an alcoholic was less. It was the socially acceptable. Yeah, right, more right, socially right, right. acceptable. Right, right. So I, I started talking about it, and I decided I'd start this nonprofit. Uh, to talk about, to, to, to just to, not to be in the dark, because I didn't know, I thought that I was the only person in the world that had this, you know, mm. depression. And once I was working on it, working through it, I, I realized that it wasn't permanent, that it was ebbs and flows, and I, I learned how to deal with it when it, when it does come. Uh, I, you know, I, I learned better coping mechanisms. Uh, up until then, you know, my coping mechanism was 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 alcohol and 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 Vicodin. I became addicted to Vicodin. It was it was gnarly, uh, and so. But now, the idea that the people are talking, celebrities are talking about it all the time. You know, um, and I'm 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 rather grateful and and and, and uh, proud that we were able to to begin that conversation. Uh, and that's what No Kidding Me Too is all about, is, is when you mention it, then people oh, would always say, oh, no kidding, me too, my brother, no kidding, me too, my, my sister, me, you, you know. Uh, and there's a lot, that, you know, I, I, I still do a lot of talks, mental health talks. You know, the, the, the kids, um, uh, teenagers, uh, suicide rates are, are going up. And, you know, the clinical... Uh, definition of anxiety is losing losing pleasure in things that you used to enjoy doing, um, and uh, you know being anxious when there's nothing to be anxious, 
uh, being depressed when there's no physical evidence of something that, you know, that situational depression. But, you know, as, as, a, as a, a, our country and the world, there's so much going on. Um, we're all in a situational depression. We just don't know what's going to happen. We don't, you know, with AI, this is the first time in, in, in our generation, this is the first time in the history of humankind where we don't know what the world is going to be like in 20 years. Yeah. You know, if you were born in the 1950, uh, you know, you, if your father was a baker, you were going to be a baker. <laughs> you know, if you, you know, a mechanic, you were going to be a mechanic. Um, and now it's happening so fast, we're just flying by the seat of our pants and we're seeing our friends being laid off left and right. And so we are reacting appropriately. We are appropriately depressed. We are appropriately <laughs> anxious. Yeah. Um, I think you're, it's removing that stigma, I think, is what you've been able to do. Um, and you and a lot of those in the entertainment industry that you've gathered together yeah, for this. And, and you feel less alone when you talk yeah. about it. Yeah, you know, yeah. And that's, that's the first step into management. Well, we're not alone. And, and that's the thing. When you can surround yourself with others that can help out, that's, you need that support system. We're so glad you're doing that. Um, yeah, the, the nonprofit organization is no kidding me, too, so check it out. Um, my goodness. I, I mean, we could talk all day to you. Your, your career is un, unbelievable. Happy pre-40th anniversary to the Goonies. I think is next year. That would be a great time to announce the Goonies, too. We would love to see that. That'd be nice. Um, whatever Marvel project that I'm going to try to drag out of you for the rest of the weekend, we are loving that that's going to happen. We're going to love seeing you in this. Fans, give it up. Joe Pantoliano. <laughs>